Good morning and welcome, and we're going to open it.
that many lives will continue to be touched by Jesus and by your spirit through their efforts and their labors. We pray that you would be with Pastor Dan and Fiona and as they rest and relax a little bit this week and just pray that you would help them, uh, Father, and uh, be with them and bring them back to us safely. And we pray, Father, that you would uh, watch over uh, the other mission teams that are headed over the next week or two and just bless them. We ask now in this moment, uh, as we turn to your words, that it would become food uh, for our brains, that it would challenge us. It would, Father, uh, speak to us and cause us to see you in a deeper and more intimate way, and that we might be more committed to you and your church and your ministry. So, Father, we just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. We don't, uh, we often hear that our grandchildren are singing, and like most grandparents, we're pretty proud of them, uh, but I somehow lured them into coming and sharing with us this morning, so they're going to come and share with us at this time.
Thank you, ladies. They're almost getting big enough. I can't call them girls anymore. But... Isn't it interesting, you know, in the realm of ladies that uh, they don't mind being called girls when they're young, but they get a certain age, they don't want to be called girls, but then they get to another age when they want to be called girls. <laughs> really. Well, thanks for coming this morning. Their great-grandmother wanted to be here this morning, but she's not feeling well, so she couldn't uh, join us this morning. And uh, she wasn't real happy about that. She, she was pretty upset about that, but anyway. I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 9. We're going to look at Acts chapter 9. Beginning with verse 1, we're going to read the first eight verses. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. So they led him away by the hand into Damascus. We trust the Lord will bless his word as we share it together. Saul was a very religious man. Grew up in the church. He was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. In other words, he was one of the church elite leaders, and his father was one of the church's elite leaders as a Pharisee. And so like some of the people that I see here who grew up in this church from the time they were just little, whose parents grew up in this church from the time they were little, Saul was a church individual. He was a religious person. And he grew up being very zealous, very uh, excited, if we can put it that way, about his religion. When you stop and think that Saul went to the other Pharisees and to the chief priest himself and said, listen, this group of people that are causing us so many problems, we need to get rid of them and, and I want to be the, the, the leader in getting rid of them. <coughs> And he says, can I have orders to arrest anybody found in the temple or in the synagogues that, that are participating in this Jesus thing? And that's what the way was called in the early days. It was called the way. It was those who were following Jesus. And he wanted to bring them back to Jerusalem and put them in prison and persecute them. And he was very excited and zealous for his uh, religion. And... Uh, <laughs> He was more concerned about his religion prospering and going forward than he was about making money or any other vocation that he might have been involved in. If we were looking at Saul today from an evangelical pers perspective, we'd say he was a, a, a fervent evangelist in his field and in his church. And yet here in Acts chapter 9, as in his excitement and zeal, he's heading to Damascus. Suddenly, Saul falls to his knees and is overcome 
by the brilliance of something he's never experienced before. Something he's never seen before. Something that he doesn't understand. And yet he senses someone's presence in this meeting. And he goes, who are you? Who are you? Saul, like so many, was caught up in his religion. But yet here on the road to Damascus, he can't explain the person that he is standing before, or should I say kneeling before, because he falls to his face in the brilliance. And he can't understand the glorious presence of the person in front of him because he's never met him. And he says, who are you? Who did Paul, Saul, who later became Paul, as he was renamed, and it's always hard to preach with Saul Paul, because you get them both. So whichever one comes out, guess what? That's the guy. It's the same fellow. But it's him. And he, and he meets this person, and, and, he, and he doesn't know who he is. And he says, who are you? And the answer is, I am Jesus. Now, Saul had seen Jesus when he walked the face of this earth. He had seen him in his earthly life with his disciples. He had been there when the disciples were meeting and standing before the Pharisees. He was there when the Pharisees commanded the disciples not to teach or preach in the name of Jesus. He thought he knew Jesus. He thought he knew who Jesus was and what he was like. But here on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus. that he'd never seen before. Well, you see, Saul had seen him as Jesus the man. But this day, he saw him as Jesus God. A lot of people think Jesus was a wonderful man. A lot of people say he was a really good man. He did a lot of wonderful things. But they don't accept him as God. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't accept him as God. But here on the road to Damascus, even the Pharisees and the religious elite of the Jewish community didn't accept him as God when he walked this earth. But here on the road to Damascus, as he fell before the brilliance of the presence of the living God, he realized and found out that Jesus was God. He was who he said he was. All the time he walked this earth, he said he was God. That the Father and him were one. He saw the glorious presence of God on the road to Damascus. In Revelation chapter 1, it gives us a, a, an appearance of Jesus from the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. And it says, I turned around, verse 12, and see the voice that was speaking to me. And this is Jesus talking to John. And he says, when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. 
In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its brilliance, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Paul met the glorified, risen Christ, who was God. God the Father, God the Son. He saw him. In Revelation chapter 21, it says, I did not see a temple in the city. He's talking about heaven. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb, talking about Jesus, is its lamp. There is nothing in all of creation like realizing and seeing the brilliance of the presence of God. If you've ever stood on the shore at the edge of the ocean in the early hours of the morning as the sun bursts above the shoreline and the first rays begin to fill the world, that part of the world that you're in and see the brilliance of it, what a beautiful sight. Some of us have had the privilege to see mountains up close and watch as the setting sun, with all of its golden rays, drops down behind the snow-capped peaks, and you stand in awe. In Central America, on one of the mission trips, I watched a 250-foot waterfall uh, cascading down the side of a mountain, dropping into a pool of water. And as the sun reflected, and the little looked like rainbows, and all the things that go with it, you stand in awe. As a parent, and more so in our generation, and our children's generation, and the generations before, but when you see and hear that baby as it's first born, and the cry, you stand in awe. I can remember a Sunday school teacher, and who, you'll like this one because he took us over to the mirror machine somewhere out that way, and it was, and, and, and I saw for the first time in my life salmon trying to get up over rapids as they jumped out of the water, and I was mesmerized. Susan and I saw three deer on our way up this morning, standing, looking at us like I said, it's like they were saying, "What are you going to get ready for?" Beautiful. There are dozens and dozens of things that we can describe that we see in life, and they're awesome to us. There's nothing compares to that moment when you see Jesus and realize who he is. A lot of people talk about Jesus. A lot of people think they know Jesus. A lot of church people, a lot of religious people have some theology about Jesus. Some people grow up in the church and, and, and well, I'm a Baptist, and, and, or I'm a Pentecostal, or I'm a Wesleyan, or whatever, but they've never seen Jesus. How sad. Jesus. God. The Bible says... Nothing was created without his hand being involved in it. And this is the Jesus who, who separated the water from the earth on the day of creation. This is the Jesus who spoke. And sunlight came. And a moon came. This is the Jesus the God who spoke, and animals were there, and plants came out, and flowers, and they're so beautiful. This is the Jesus. This is Jesus who's God. 
He's not just Jesus of some religion. He's not just some Jesus of, of, of Hebrew history or anything else. He's God, Jesus. And that's why Paul didn't recognize him, because he'd never met God, Jesus, before. <coughs> Excuse me. The creator of the universe. And all of the things that we see. But Saul not only experienced the glory of God, Jesus. He met the risen Savior. He met the risen Savior. I don't know if he saw Jesus when he walked after that 40 days after he was risen on the earth before he ascended. But today, he met the risen Savior. Saul, who did everything he could do to destroy the church. Saul, who did everything he could do to persecute and torture Christians. Now on his face, be the four of the one he was persecuting. Jesus, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. The risen Savior. Think about this for a second. Here's Saul, and, and he's out there persecuting and having put to death and, and, and wreaking havoc and trying to destroy all that Jesus is trying to build. And suddenly he stands and he falls before his face and there's Jesus. What do you think went through his mind? I know what would go through mine. Uh-oh, I'm toast. That's what would go through your mind. Now is the day of accountability. Today's payday. Like this is not going to end good. Because I'm going to face the judgment of God. And just think about Saul. He had all this Old Testament knowledge that he'd learned as studying to be a Pharisee. He'd seen what God does to his enemies. And suddenly he, the enemy of Jesus Christ, is on his face before Jesus. I know in my heart he had to be afraid. I would be. But he meets the risen Savior. The transforming love and grace of God is what he experiences. Oh no, he's not put to death. He's not sent straight to hell. Jesus looks at him and says, I've got something for you to do. I've got something for you to do. Doesn't make sense to me. John Newton penned it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see. It's grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. Saul met the risen Savior. He met the one who, before he knew anything about it, had planned and put into place all of the events that would bring himself to this old earth to be mocked and ridiculed and crucified for Saul. That he might experience the forgiving grace of God. He met Jesus, God, and that's pretty terrifying. He met Jesus, the Savior. He met the grace of God. God's riches at Christ's expense. In that thorough study of the Old Testament, I'm sure he thought about it many times in those few minutes what his punishment might be. But Jesus said, get up, I've got something for you to do. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that meant Saul. When Jesus left heaven, 
he had in his mind. Saul was lost. He might be wretched, miserable, terrible individual when it came to Christians, but he was a lost soul that needed the grace of God. And so God sent Jesus. And Saul met him on that day in the road to Damascus. He didn't think he was lost. I guarantee you he did not think he was lost. He grew up in church. He was a religious leader. He was zealous and on fire for his religion. And, and he knew about God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he knew about God of David and Elijah and Elisha. And he could probably quote all kinds of scripture from the Old Testament. And he didn't think he was lost. He thought he was on the right way. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says in Proverbs 16:25. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. And you see, it doesn't matter if you grew up in the heart of the Baptist Church, People's Church, the Wesleyan Church, the Pentecostal Church, the Presbyterian Church. It doesn't matter if you grew up in church and you can quote the scripture from the back to the front. If you haven't met Jesus, you're still lost. He met Jesus. And this tremendously religious man that a lot of people looked up to as a religious leader <clears throat> got saved. He experienced the transforming, loving grace of God. In Acts chapter 7, verse 54 through 60, we read these words. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coat at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep or he died. And Saul was there giving approval to the murder of Stephen because Stephen was a Christian. There's an interesting verse before that in chapter 6 that says this. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And here's Saul giving approval and holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen, saying, give it to him. He doesn't deserve to live. And yet when he meets Jesus, probably expecting the same kind of treatment, he finds the love and the mercy and the grace of God. I believe that Saul, in those moments, on the ground before Jesus, not only seen Jesus, but he also saw the face of Stephen. I also believe he remembered the words of Stephen. I believe that the life of Stephen, Stephen so impacted Saul's life that when he met Jesus, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he realized that Stephen had met Jesus. And when Stephen said, I saw Jesus, he was telling the truth. Because I believe he not only met the love and the grace of God, but he met the presence and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That no matter what you're going through in life, if you're a Christian, no matter what you have to face in life, he's there with you. As Stephen fell under the weight of the stones and the pain and the agony of crushing him and breaking his bones and taking the life out of him, he saw Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. He saw Jesus waiting for him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, In Acts chapter 6, that place where the face of Stephen was like an angel. I've tried to picture that many times. 
I can't picture this face like an angel. I've looked in the mirror many times, but it doesn't come out that way. But we know it was the fullness of God's presence in Stephen's life that made him appear that way. Have you met Jesus? Have you met Jesus who's God? Not Jesus of some religion, not Jesus of some church name, but Jesus who's God. Have you experienced the grace, the forgiveness of God? Next Sunday morning we're going to look at this same passage of Scripture. We're going to look at what Saul saw within himself. But right now we're looking at what he saw when it came to Jesus. But have you met Jesus? Does the presence of the living God, Jesus Christ, the Son, Spirit live within you? In January of 1973, which makes it 46 years ago this month, I grew up in Sunday school and church. Mother drug me there. Father told me within an inch, would whip me within an inch of my life if I didn't go. He never went, but he made sure we went. He'd get up and say, you're going to Sunday school with your mother, right? And he'd go back to bed or go somewhere. But I grew up in Sunday school church. Knew lots of scriptures. Learned all those Bible lessons, Bible stories like most kids in that age group, that time. When I was 15, 16, 17, I went just to please my mother once in a while, enough to keep my father off my case. In January of 1973, I was walking home with my bare feet in the snow. Because it was easier to walk in my bare feet that were bleeding than it was to put my sneakers on that I blistered my feet playing basketball. Now I know it doesn't look like it. This doesn't picture playing basketball. But walking home, I met Jesus. We had a fresh snow and it was glistening. And somewhere, some scripture from some Sunday school lesson or message I heard in church talked about your sin should be white as snow. And the presence of the living God flooded that, my heart and my mind and I knew that God was there and he was saying to me, what are you going to do with Jesus? And here's what's really weird. The next Sunday we went to church and the pastor, and he never ever spoke to me going out other than maybe to say hi. He said, Robert, it's about time you did something with Jesus. The very next morning. And I looked at him and I said, I did last night. All by myself, walking home. And that the risen Christ. And from that day to this, it's never been the same. And my greatest heart's desire is that, I know there's been rough days and tough days and everything else, but my greatest desire is that my children and my grandchildren and my family and my friends and my neighbors and the people that I live around would know the tremendous joy of Jesus. Jesus. If you would, for just a moment, if you can do it without falling asleep, close your eyes and think about Jesus. Picture him seated at the Father's right hand. What does he mean to you? Can you see him as God? There's a song that fills my heart all the time, and I try to sing it all the time. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. 
Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Every need he is supplying, plenteous grace he bestows. Every day my way gets brighter, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing in closing this morning a couple of choruses. I want us to focus on Jesus, to think about him. We need to ask ourselves, have we met Jesus? Is he God to me? Is he the risen Savior? Is he my Savior? It's not one thing for him to be the Savior of the world. It's the question, is he my Savior? Does he live by his Spirit in my heart? Is he precious to me? Is he important to me? And do I long with all of my heart for others to know the joy, the joy of Jesus in my life? Let's sing together. Father, bless each one, make them a blessing to others, we pray in Jesus' name.